Warning, the Catholic Man Show is about to begin. If you're looking for a dull, feel-good religion, or clap your hands, sit around the campfire kumbaya, you've come to the wrong place. We are dealing with toxic levels of authentic masculinity. I would say good luck, but luck is for pagans. Welcome to the Catholic Command Show. We're on the Lord's team, the winning side, so raise your glass. I'm Adam Minahan, sitting here with David Niles. We have Sir Posada. I'm here on the on the buttons this evening. We are we are not with Jim. Jim is not here. He is not here this evening, but that's okay. Uh, we are also having this evening the wise man it's a kentucky owl product the wise man bourbon kentucky straight bourbon whiskey 45.4 percent alcohol i'm excited about it because kentucky owl has very expensive uh whiskeys some of their whiskeys start out at 300 dollars. wow however this one is relatively new and it is less than 50 i think okay so I, if i remember correctly is i think it was about 48 dollars it's gonna be terrible 48 dollars i think is what it was nice i was just kidding about that <laughs> we're doing this on a different uh night this evening recording on a different night we have the catholic the tulsa catholic radio <laughs> Just poured a ridiculous glass for one. Uh, it wasn't that big. Um, we have our Catholic Radio fundraiser this Friday. So if you're listening to this show live on Catholic Radio currently, please say a quick prayer that for the success of the fundraiser that we continue to focus on God's will, uh, that we can continue to help evangelize the people here in Tulsa and eastern Oklahoma. This might be the most stressful week of the year for me. It's one, the last actually four weeks, right after uh, Halloween to Theology of the Tower is always crazy for us. We always, for the radio station. Because the radio station, and it seems like we have several Catholic Man Show projects or just other things that we're trying to finish up. Ooh. That is delicious. I, mean, I, I haven't even. I, I've sat here and waited for I, you because you guys were all you were bad, doing dude. something, and I, I, I waited. I didn't so know. I cheers did. and well, let's let's do that now because it's good. <laughs> well, I want to do that again. The winning side. So raise your glass. Cheers, cheers to Jesus. Cheers, one. So, but so what I was saying is, we have just so many things that are going on. You have deer season that 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 happens yeah. during this time that you have to capitalize on. And then this year we also threw in. We went to uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania. I and think we, you and, should be allowed to. Ki- kill a deer year round however if it's not in the traditional deer season you have to catch it with your hands like that should be a rule that if you can if you can physically bring down a deer with nothing but your body i think you get to kill it (laughs) i mean didn't not the herd (laughs) (laughs) why are you so tired and filthy been hunting yeah Did you catch anything no <laughs> it's really hard uh, but we went to allentown pennsylvania for the men's conference yeah and then we went we also went to in bethlehem pennsylvania we also went to uh, waco or out west texas outside mm-hmm. of waco and college station texas and so we we threw that in the mix and then we also threw in the mix trying to finish up our manuscript that we're writing yeah so between all of that, which we're not exactly supposed to talk about. We're allowed to talk. We're just not allowed to talk about it. What the it details. Is. No deets. No details. No deets. Turns out we found out. Oh, well, we we're not supposed to be doing that. Yeah. But so we so, threw in a couple extra projects this a year. Ma- a manuscript that we may or may not be writing. That may or may not be published. That's right. That's more 
Yeah. <laughs> That's more the question. Well, also, it's a question of may or may not be writing it. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's been a lot of not been writing it. Yes. But we hopefully by January next year, it will be published and available. We will have more details on that soon. So January. Did I say January? I meant July. It, Jan- I, I'll tell you, January is not going to Did I say happen. January You said one? January. I'm so sorry. I meant July. Is that some of the deets we're not supposed to be saying? I can say, We can say those deets. Okay. Especially if if you throw them off. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if the details are wrong. Um, Let's talk about so, this whiskey. Okay, so, I want to talk about so we ha- it. So we're having the wise men. We're going to talk about Advent this evening. We're going to talk about preparing for Christmas, ways that you can uh, start traditions within your family of how to have a holy and fruitful Advent yeah. during this penitential time. Mm-hmm. And it's very appropriate, I felt like, that we have a wise man whiskey i mean epiphany would have been better i get it but sometimes they don't link up that way well you know what this one's the way this is hitting me so far i say we do it again really yeah this is fantastic on the nose i get uh banana nut bread Hmm. and maple there's not a whole it's not a uh it's not really strong on the nose the, you know, oh, I see, man. I I immediately said banana, maple, no, no, no. Vanilla. I, I just mean it's not a powerful aroma. Sometimes there are some whiskeys you pour, and you can just the glass can still be setting on the on the table, and you can smell it from your chair. You know what I mean? Uh, when like when I, mm-hmm. to me, it's not not a super strong smell. Is all I'm trying to say. Okay. You don't think so? Feel free. Oh to- no, I'm I'm I was just. You, I, I stopped just, listening. To you're you. just in your own world. Yes. Interesting. Okay, so the beginning of this was a lot sweeter than what I I was expecting. The the front. Uh, oh, did you try it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sweet at the very beginning, in my in my mm-hmm. opinion, with the hints of vanilla, uh, caramelized something like a, a sweetness to it. Uh, a little bit of that banana. But then at the the back side, it turns because it's it tastes stronger proof. It tastes like a stronger proof than what it is. I think it, it heats up and it tastes like, more peppery, uh, a little bit more fire. It's like a reverse sour patch, except mm-hmm. it didn't get sour with the spice. With the spice, yeah, yeah. It's good, yeah. I, I'm a, uh, as we go throughout the evening, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll let you know I my thoughts. Especially for if it's under fifty dollars, like that's really good. Nice medium long finish. Yeah, it's good. I think it's better that temp- than that Templeton that we had. Of course, that was a rye recently, but we also had yeah. that Forester nine nineteen twenty. I think that one was a little bit better than this one. But it is a very interesting. Bourbon, especially if it's if it's Kentucky Owl. I'm not super familiar with Kentucky Owl, probably because most of their whiskeys are higher dollar, which would make sense was why I'm right. not as familiar with it. Yeah. But I like the label as well, and I'm a sucker for presentation. Uh, I, I like the label. I think that it, it looks uh, classy. It looks it fits the part. I like it. So far, I'm a, I'm a fan. Me too. So Where did you get it? The liquor store. Yeah, which one? Um, I don't remember. Okay. Typically, I get my my whiskey from a liquor store. Guided by wisdom and crafted with knowledge. Nice. So, it's anyway. Like, that's one of those things is like, mm, does that mean something? I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> is that just words put together? Is that some, it's like, that sounds like something important, but is that just something... I like it. So, the Bible or the Bible study you you're doing a Bible study currently, but the book club that we're doing with the patrons, the, several of our guys that I meet with every week, we're doing a book from Gary Gould Lagrange, Father Gary Gould Lagrange, uh, called "To Mystic Common Sense." It's a tough book. It's been, but it's been very fruitful thus far. Mm. And one of the things that I really enjoyed was getting just getting a chance. You know, when you get a chance to just meet with a, a group of guys every single week. You get to know them better. You get to understand sure. their yeah. life. And one of the things that they, we were talking about recently was how to. Uh, they appreciated the last year's episode that we did when we talked about Advent, mm-hmm. and how like the 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 practicalities of 
what to do, what not to do. And that we were talking more, and I realized that, man, that they were giving me a, a lot of good ideas, and I, they said basically we, we could definitely do another show on it because we didn't t- we didn't touch on all the things that, that we could possibly talk about, obviously. Oh, yeah. And so when we were trying to figure out what, what topic to do this week, I was really glad that we decided on this because, one, it, it helps me. Listening to them, it actually puts me, you know, it puts me back in check of, of striving to do better listening to what they're doing it's like oh man i i didn't even think about doing that i'm not doing that i I should up my game Mm -hmm. Uh, another benefit of having uh holy friends um but then also just like you would know i'm not sure that i have any but but at least you can see the fruits (laughs) um but anyway so i i was glad that we were going to be able to talk about this this uh, this evening me too yeah because you're right i mean advent uh it, Advent's totally the, the you know like the stepbrother of of Lent. It's a you know it's also a penitential season. Mm-hmm. It's purple. It's the other purple. It's the other purple season. Uh, but I think it's like one people don't they're not nearly as intentional about. It's become more almost like a party instead of right. the preparing exactly. of, of Christ coming exactly instead of preparing for the feast. We do a lot of the feasting, and that's kind of a Protestant thing where they feast up until the day, and then they stop. You know what I mean? Right. The fast should come before the feast. Right. You have to prepare for the feast right. before you feast. So, so right. when we get back, we're gonna talk about vices. Vices. Not what you think. We'll be back. This segment of The Catholic Man Show is brought to you by the Catholic woodworker Jonathan Conrad focuses on equipping families for battle in the modern world. We're very excited that the Catholic Woodworker sponsors our show. Everything that they put out is top-notch. It's heirloom quality. It's handmade. Whether it's home altars, crucifixes, or rosaries, they're actually now the producer of the official rosary of the Catholic Man Show. So go check it out. Yeah, if you use TCMS for the Catholic Man Show as a promo code, you get 10% off all of your purchases. Let's him know that we sent you. He'll continue supporting the show. Go support Jonathan at thecatholicwoodworker.com. Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles here with Adam Minahan. We're sans Jimbo Baggins today. I feel vulnerable about the bodyguard here. Anybody, I mean, just anybody, could stroll up to your front door, break into the house. They'd have to obviously get past the deadbolt and other things. But they could just totally get in. Without our bodyguard here. And then come upstairs and, and get in here. Mm-hmm. And be and all look like... Look at all this whiskey in here. Mischievous or whatever be ridiculous. they would do. Anyway, I'm just going to try not to think about it, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to carry on. My wayward son. Yeah. Okay, so uh, man gear today is a vice... I prefer virtue. I do too. Um, over the this summer at the cat at our campout, I was talking to George Carpenter, the blacksmith of Clear Creek, Our Lady of Clear Creek Abbey, uh, master, master blacksmith, master carver, master artisan. Very interesting guy. Uh, and he, we were talking about the show and just about you know different things. And he kind of looks down. He says, "Dave, I am a, I'm a man of many vices." And I mean that I own many vices. And as he said that, right behind him, he pointed, and he had a table with like eight or nine vices on it. You know, it was, it was a good moment. It was, it was very funny. And actually, the guy is a man of many vices, I will tell he you. He tried to play that joke in our Pennsylvania talk, and it did not land as well. No. That's okay. You can't, you can't win can't, them all. can't win them all. Save it for the conference, for the comedy conference. Yeah, we'll, say we'll we'll fine tune it for the comedy I'll, conference. I'll work on it. I'm gonna work on it. Yeah, because uh, I think it's it's got potential. It's just we we gotta get our chops down, man. We gotta get That's our right. chops. That's right. Get into the groove. So, uh, I have had a a bench vice, you know, on my list for a couple of years. 
The problem is, unless you want something that's just junk, it's expensive. That is accurate. Uh, and if you don't believe me, like get online and look at reviews of people who bought a hundred dollar vice, and they said like I used it one time, and the and the whole neck cracked, you know, or the jaws broke right off, or something. Right. Um, and so I didn't want that, and so you, you kind of have to spend about two hundred dollars before you get something that starts to have positive reviews, and that's all. About, that's all I'm judging it on is like the reviews. The thing about manufacturing in America is we know how to make quality things but you just have to pay for it that's the thing so there's only one there's only one vice manufacturer left in america is wilson uh will you look that up one wilson vices i think that's i think that's the one i have i thought it was watson but maybe wilson well if you have a wilson vice it's worth about a thousand dollars i got mine at a secondhand store yeah um so brand new Wilton. Wilton, that's what it is. That's who, that's what you have. You have a Wilton vice. I have a Wilton vice. No kidding. That's yes. awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh it's a big one. That is, I mean, like, so they're they're the that's cream of the crop cream of the crop right now. Um I was looking at a Yoast vice, uh, which Yoast seems to have pretty good reviews. It's still owned by it's a Chinese company, just like all the other mm-hmm. vice manufacturers. There used to be a lot in like Germany and Europe, but now they're all in China, except for like Wilton. Is that what it was? Wilton? Wilton. Um, so the the cheapest Wilton I could find was like $1,500. Um, wow. 1500 On Amazon, anyway. So uh, I... Guess I, what? Guess what? I just have a new vice. It's on the market. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I will totally sell that thing. I will take a... Chi- I'll take a Chinese one for $1,000. Thank you. Um... <laughs> So I had this Yoast I was looking at. It was really, you know, it had like, oh, the pipe grip on one side. The, you know, it had a Did uh, it swivel? An- anvil. Yes, 360 degree swivel. Nice. But I was, I was thinking, I cannot buy a vice without calling my blacksmith friend, George Carpenter. Talk, vice. Talking to him. And so we got to talking and he Did said... Did he talk you out of it? Uh, no, he didn't. Uh, he encouraged me to like hold off and... Go find one at yeah. a secondhand store. And, and the thing is, like, you'll have to restore it. And maybe you don't want to do that. And if you don't want to do it, then just get a new one. But he, he said, like, the truth is he doesn't know much about new vices. Uh, because all all the ones he has are, you know, 100 years old or more. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he says, you can just go to pawn shops or even antique shops and say, where's the rust? Right. Just take, where, where do you keep the rust? Mm-hmm. And, you know, you will have to restore them. So, But... Literally, this is what he said to me is the, at the end of our phone conversation. He said, David, Dave, God has a vice out there for you <laughs> that he wants you to and have. And you're like, I know, I've been to college. I have many yeah. of them. <laughs> trying to get rid of I'm trying to unload them. Yeah. He said, he does, Dave. He's got a vice picked out for you. And he's he's got one in mind that he wants you to have. And it was like, yeah, well, okay. I, you know, yeah, maybe it's this new one I'm looking at here. Right. You know. <laughs> On Amazon. So can that have, night... Can have it here by tomorrow. That night, we went over to my dad's house to watch the, the Bedlam game. Mm. Which... Go get, Pokes. Go Pokes. Go Pokes. My son, he's one and a half. The, uh, when OSU scored their first touchdown... Did he wave the wheat? I said, Davey, wave your wheat. And I put my hand up like this. And he did it. Yes. Like he, we had it's been, a great mimic. We didn't, you, you can mimic that. We didn't even practice it. He just nailed it. Love anyway, it. So we're over, I'm over there eating dinner. And telling my parents that, you know, oh, yeah, I could talking to George, and, you know, about vices. And my mom goes, oh, well, I, a uh, couple days ago, I just dug one up out of the ground outside. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what? She's like, yeah, I was digging and I hit something. And so I kept digging around it and it's a huge vice. And I said, are you serious? Let me see it. <laughs> and so. You gotta be kidding me. Uh. Here it is on on screen right here. Uh, it's a Holland's uh, vice. It's a, a number ninety three, which I have not been able to find the number ninety three online. It's not in any of the the catalogs that, that are left. So this company Holland's was started in eighteen eighty seven, and became they originally started making burners, uh, but then they quickly expanded their manufacturing, and became one of the number one manufacturers in the world, um, and they were bought out in nineteen fifty six. 
Um, and so this this vice, I mean, I who knows how old it is. God already had a vice. I mean, it's in like mind literally that day. George is telling me, you know, Dave, he's God. He's got a vice for you. I mean, he's got one for you. He wants you to have. <laughs> and then, like hours later, my mom's like, "Oh, really? I dug one up out of the ground outside." That you know, so it's crazy. So, it reminds me, he's like, "Yeah, I went fishing and I caught this fish, and there were two coins inside." <laughs> do, do you think that means something? <laughs> and so, what I've done is I took it home. Uh, if you saw it in the picture right there, uh, and if you didn't see the picture, you can go watch our YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Um, they, it took, uh, you know, like maybe 30, 45 minutes of not super dedicated work, but kind of casually scraping and wire brushing um, to get it in that condition. It's, it's seized up. It doesn't, it doesn't turn. <clears throat> so what I'm doing is I built an electrolysis tank. So electrolysis is a... It's the best way of removing rust, certainly that I know of. But what you do is you just take a tank and you fill it with water. So you need something that's plastic that you could submerge your rusted item in. <clears throat> and then you have to put some other metal, some scrap metal or something, n- non-galvanized, just like st- regular old steel, something else that will rust. So I'm using rebar, have rebar around, and I'm just using a, a plastic trash can. Um, and those are all wired together just with regular copper wire. Okay. And so then I'm sub- I'm hanging the vise into the water also using copper wire. So that copper wire sticks up out of the water and I have a 12 volt car battery charger. And you add sodium carbate carbonate sodium carbonate to the water. Oh, it's Arm & Hammer Super Washing Soda. That's what you want to get. Arm & Hammer Super Washing Soda. They sell it basically everywhere. Um, Don't get the regular washing soda. Get the super. Yeah. Uh, Figure so, out what's going to kill you and then back it off just a little, a little bit. bit. Right. So sodium carbonate is... Uh, baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. This is sodium carbonate. Basically, it allows the water to conduct electricity a little bit better. Okay. Because water actually does not conduct electricity, just so you know. If you have tap wa- if you have distilled water, it will not conduct electricity. It's actually the impurities and other things in the water hmm. that actually are conducting the electricity. Um, so you put that in there, and basically you you hook it up. You run a current through it. So you actually want to put the, the negative needs to be hooked up to the thing that you have that's rusted. Because people think... The elect- rebar. Yeah, not, not the rebar. Oh. The vice. Oh, the vice. Okay. Yeah, that you're trying to clean. People think that electricity goes from positive to negative. It doesn't. It goes from negative to positive. When they invented elect- when they were like discovering electricity, they thought, oh, it's the protons that are the electricity. And so all of the formulas actually for electricity that we use in physics and science, they're all actually wrong. You're, you're actually solving for a negative number, and they didn't know it. Now, so if, you get an, if you're doing these formulas and come up with like answer of five, really the answer is negative five. It doesn't matter. It's, they all still work. Okay. So you hook the negative up because that you want the electricity to flow from your rusted thing to the other rebar. Okay. So it's it's similar to like plating when you would gold plate stuff, sort of, that you're taking the rust off and kind of sending it over to the rebar. So I've got it soaking in there right now. This is a, it's a severely rusted. I think it's going to take about 48 hours. But my hope is when I pull it out, that it's going to be like new. Are you are you going to try to coat it? Like put some paint like paint like I don't know. I'm going to see what it looks like still when I'm done. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm definitely going to have to oil it at least otherwise it's just going to oh, yeah. rust. You, you, I mean you it's definitely gonna... oil it, but I if I were you I'd put like rust oleum paint on it or something like that yeah. outside of the gri- outside of the cl- grips and things like that. I'm going to look it up because like if it rusts a little bit that might be okay. Like uh, rust actually will preserve things in a, in a certain way but the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into that. What's the best thing to do? Because sometimes you paint it, and now it's like, oh, it's not worth as much. You, ru- you ruin it. You know what I mean? Okay. Well, let's talk about Advent. Okay. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. 
Our drink of choice this evening is The Wise Man by Kentucky Al. Just got done talking about Vice and the ridiculous story that Dave had on finding advice. We talk, talk about Advent. As we discussed in, in the first segment, Dave, a lot of times it's it's been Advent is a, a, a feast or a festival mm-hmm. leading up to Christmas, and in fact, it's it's a it's a penitential season. It's, right. It's preparing ourselves. Uh, Father Define here in Tulsa, his homily this last week was preparing ourselves for uh, the mercy and the judgment of Christ. Right. So you're you're preparing yourself twice for the, for, for two two comings: the coming of mercy that that Christ became flesh, that that God the God became flesh and incarnate and entered this world to save us, and then the coming of our judgment because. Because he comes into this world uh, to save us, then it, it which follows to the judgment, your your your, your judgment. So it's it's the coming of of mercy and the coming of uh, of judgment. Um, and so we should be preparing ourselves for this, right? Mm-hmm. We should be uh, weeding out any vice that we have, any uh, apathetic tendencies that we have, any uh, slothful habits that we have to prepare ourselves. And be mindful of the of the four last things. That's I mean that's that's really what right. Advent is supposed to remind us of is the four last things: uh, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Uh, yes. Um, in order in order to prepare ourselves for for the Word becoming flesh. I think the kind of the defining characteristic of the Advent season is hope. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that to me that's what it is. It's a hopeful season, first and foremost. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it's not Lent. It's different from Lent. It's a penitential season kind of in a different way. Um, I'll just... Here's here's what I'm doing for Advent this year, personally. Uh, I know that I, I desire a deeper commitment to the Holy Mass. <clears throat> like, go, you look at the saints, they go to Holy Mass every day. Every day. Every I day. mean, basically, I mean, there's a reason fail. probably why most... Uh, saints or canonized saints are priests or religious nuns. Yeah, because they have the time to to dedicate like that. And even the ones who aren't priests or religious nuns, they still go to mass every day. Every day. I mean, obviously, there's like hermits who couldn't do that, but still. So what I'm doing is here in the first week of Advent, I'm adding one daily mass uh, throughout in the week. In addition to what you're already doing, because yeah, you, you go to two da- well. Typically? I was going to daily mass uh, like every Friday. That was part of my until until COVID hit, and then uh, things got my the schedule just doesn't it's not there anymore. Like that mass isn't offered anymore. Oh, okay. That was because I used to go right before work on Friday, right after adoration and mm-hmm. before work, I'd go to mass. It's a great way to start a Friday with an hour of adoration, the holy sacrifice of the mass. Get to work in a great mood every Friday. So, but you know that was like a year and a half ago. Um, so I'm adding one mass the first week. In the second week of Advent, Advent I will go to two masses throughout the week. In the third week of Advent, I will go to you guessed it, three masses. And it works this year because I think Christmas is on a Saturday this year. So uh, I'll be able to go to four masses on these in these the fourth week of advent I, that will not always be the case you know mm-hmm. if christmas is on a monday you're not going to four daily masses but so that's what i'm doing um excited about it because it's i'm also ha- it's it's making me do i think what you should be doing in advent i'm having to look ahead and plan mm-hmm. you know i'm having to kind of anticipate things that are coming mm-hmm. which that's you know kind of the the basic thing that we do in Advent. Well, it's the basic thing of how you grow in holiness mm-hmm. is preparing true. preparing yourself for what is to come. I mean, you talk about this uh, several times on the show, Dave. Like, unless you have thought about a scenario and how you would react when the scenario comes up, if you have not thought about that scenario, sometimes you freeze or you panic yeah. or you don't do what you you think you should do. Yeah, because you haven't thought out the whole thing in your head ahead of time. And, and so this is and sometimes in that moment, that's not the best time to like break things down logically right it's a time of action yeah mm-hmm. so I, I don't know if other people are like that but i'm definitely like that where this is uh the virtue of foresight you know mm-hmm. being able to see ahead and being prepared to yeah. um to grow in holiness 
So and, and to what and what is to come. So uh, I wanted to talk about caroling. Um, we did that. We need to get that on the schedule. I thought about that, that last yesterday. year. We need to get that on our calendar. And you know, quick. caroling is also you can do it in Advent, but I think it's also really a Christmas thing. So like, if you do it in like, especially during the octave of Christmas, I think that's a really great time to go caroling. Your neighbors might think it's weird that you're singing Christmas carols after Christmas because everybody after Christmas Day. Every yeah. everybody thinks yeah after Christmas Day. Thank you. You know, that's what we talked about kind of there for a second. Everybody thinks, oh, it's Christmas season now. And then is the day Christmas is over on is December 26th. Conclusion of... Now it's about like New Year's. Right. You know, put all the Christmas stuff away. I mean, people will literally take their Christmas tree down the day after Christmas. Right. It's just a tragedy. Uh, but they just don't know. It's still they, a tragedy. It, it is. You're right. But it's... Not... They, not, just, they just don't know. Right. Yeah. So... Uh, Caroling, though, I think is very fitting in the Advent season and in the Christmas season. I think it just changes what songs you. Right, and Advent because didn't last year we sing "O Come, O Come, Emmanuel." Yeah, like that's basically the the Advent song. And there are like a couple other Advent songs out there. Uh, they're very. They're not. They're not well known. That's right. the thing. Uh, right. But there's a couple about Our Lady. Um, like mm-hmm. uh, there's one about Ma- that mentions Mary being pregnant. I forget what it's called. Mary, did you know? Yes. That's, that's, that's Mary, did you one. know? That's the one. I think, I know it's like very popular for Catholics to hate on that song. First of all, it gets stuck in my head a lot. It It, it is a catchy tune. I like tune. to sing it. it like, yeah. It's a good song it's to sing. It's a catchy sing. tune. You can like. It's heretical, but it is You can really tune. like power sing that song, right? Mm-hmm. It's just. Uh, but I, I like. I, to, I know nothing about power singing. But. I like to use that song as an apologetic, of, as a way of explaining Mary to Protestants. Because. It, that song is exactly like Mary. The song is all like when we have devotion to Mary. That song is about Mary. You're singing to Mary. You're asking Mary. But the whole song is about Jesus. Mm, you see what yeah, I'm saying? Right. So I think it's a good analogy for explaining yeah. a Catholic's relationship with Mary. Sure. Because that's what it is. It's like, oh, this, you're singing and talking to Mary this whole song. Mm-hmm. That's you know, you're you're getting in Idolatry. the way of Jesus, right? Yeah. It's like, no, the song's about Jesus. Everything Marian is ultimately, it's always Christocentric. So I, I understand and, and agree. The song is we heretical, need, but... We need to get caroling on the calendar. You're right. So we've done that two years? No, last year was the first year. Okay, no, I did it two years then. I uh, Yes, I did it with like my parents and Pamela's parents mm-hmm. the year before. But um, you, uh, all of us did it together last, last year. year, and it was so it's, good. It was so much fun. It was so much fun, and we thought we had like these bets going on, like the over under of people like closing their doors right, on us, exactly. Because it was also like in the peak of COVID, you know, so we didn't know we couldn't touch anybody or mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Anna kept running up to the door to give the person a hug, you know, to wish them Merry Christmas, and they'd they'd be like, "Oh, don't touch me," you know. It's like, wow, three year old girl saying no to a hug anyway um but but, but almost uh, everybody loved it yes uh i think we had w- one there was have- one guy who you could tell patiently suffered through it right he was nice about it you know but you could tell like that's not what he wanted right not right at that moment but we did anyway. a, so i i loved your strategy that, that you brought up how to do it uh-huh. is you start singing and then you ring the doorbell yeah, ring so, the doorbell or ring the doorbell and start. You want to be singing before they open the door. So that Because I think you want to, it's. You want to give them an out. You want to exactly, give them an out. Like, if they don't want to open the door, that's okay. That's okay for me. Right. And that's okay for you. <laughs> right? Like, if you don't want to open the door, I also don't want you to open the door. You right. know what I mean? Like, you know what's coming. So you hear the songs. You can hear, right, exactly. Then make that choice. But I, yeah, ev- almost everybody opened the door with like excitement like christmas carolers right and what did pamela bring uh a little treat that they brought uh, some cinnamon sticks or something like that i forget yeah the kids would like go the kid would would go you know one of the kids it would take turns one lady brought us cookies right it was it was awesome she had the biggest tray of cookies i'd ever (laughs) seen so So, anyway it was just so much fun for the kids it was so much fun for us it was so much fun for the neighbors it was like one of those things where it was like really bringing joy 
to a lot of people. And I'll bet those the, our neighbors went and talked about it. I'll bet they oh, told on Facebook their uh, other our family little Facebook group that we have for their for our neighborhood. Oh yeah, our Facebook. But yeah, the neighborhood page. They yeah. were uh, they were posting on there as we were going as carolers are coming around, and then all the comments were like, "Oh, I hope they can stop by my house. Uh-huh. Oh, I hope I hope they stop at my house." Um, so yeah, I, that is so easy to do. We did three songs. You know, mm-hmm. it was so it was oh, come a, come a It was like uh, a three minute, th- three or four minute stop right. at each one. You know, so it wasn't keeping people for very long. It was uh, oh come a come a manual. I can't remember the second one, and then we wish you a merry Christmas. I, right, away in a manger. Away in a manger. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. So it was and, that was really fun. Yeah. Um, I do want to talk about some other uh, Advent ideas. Okay. Um, so. I got these ideas come from, most of these ideas come from this book that we have around the year with the Von Trapp family. It's by Maria Augusta Von Trapp mm-hmm. um, from like the Von Trapp family. Right. Not a coincidence. It's from the same family. Um, she had just some really great, great ideas in here. Um, one of them. Uh, Juan, I know I put this in here for Juan. It's the it's called Christkinder. It means uh, Christ child in German. Yeah. Uh, but basically, outside of America, especially Latin America, there's a tradition that it's baby Jesus. In fact, before I continue, we need to put out a, a like a warning that we might be talking about certain Christmas traditions for adults and children. So, we'll be right back. We'll be right back. Do you feel like God is calling you to go on a pilgrimage? Well, for the last 34 years, Select International Tours has been leading pilgrimages to holy sites all over the world. And you want when you go on pilgrimages, Dave, you want to make sure you have the great the best hotels, you're touring with the best guides, and every detail has been addressed. And that's exactly what you're getting with Select International Tours. So, For more information, go to their brand new website, selectinternationaltours.com. They have been a sponsor of the Catholic Man Show for a long time now. Even during the COVID pandemic, they were still sponsoring our show. A lot of other tour companies were really shutting down. These guys were consistent. So go to selectinternationaltours.com to find out more information about all the great pilgrimages they offer all over the world. Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles here with Adam Minahan. We're talking about Advent. I just want to reiterate our warning that we are starting. We are going to be talking about Christmas traditions, uh, some of which that are uh, traditions for children, which uh, we have in America that they don't have in other countries. So if you want your kil- your children to continue practice these traditions maybe they should stop listening uh i feel like that was sufficient yeah so i think everybody knows what we're talking about i just i also want to give them time you know give them a good five seconds anyway um because we're talking about santa claus yeah so they have this chris kinda i think i'm saying that right it doesn't look like that's how you say it but i had them i had the thing say it that's what they said so Basically, that baby Jesus is the one who brings the presents, mm. not Santa. This is how Juan grew up. He grew up with little present-bringing baby Jesus. I don't know what it would look like to see a baby carrying a bag of presents. In my mind, he still has a red bag. He's like he's just carrying Santa's <laughs> red bag. You know what I mean? Well, and, and that's how she had to eventually merge them, because Santa made it to Venezuela when I was like, you know, nine or eleven, and it's a, the tricky time. All, all, all of a sudden, she had to like explain who was Santa, and she's like, "Well, you know, baby Jesus sometimes gets tired, so he has to get on <laughs> Santa's sled." So he tag teams so with that Santa. Santa, and until I remember seeing in Disney Channel the Santa Claus, the movie the Santa oh, Claus, yeah, oh, Tim yeah. Allen, Tim Allen, and I was like, "Mom, I don't see baby Jesus anywhere in this thing." Oh, Disney ruins everything. <laughs> That's because <laughs> Americans are stupid. That's yeah. why. Yeah. I mean, uh, am I wrong? <laughs> am I wrong? <laughs> the next person who says that to me, like, seriously, I might lose it on them. I hate that. It's <laughs> just, you know, it's like, yes, you are wrong. 
<laughs> Your existence is wrong. So, uh, that's not true. What, what they do in the Von Trapp family, this I thought was a really lovely tradition. Okay. Is they pass a bowl around that has everybody a piece of paper with everyone's name on it. So they're basically drawing a name, and it's a secret. Okay, so it's sort of like Secret Santa. This is like a great version of Secret Santa. Um, and I, I have a quote here because I thought the way she said it was just really great. She says, the person whose name one has drawn is now in one's special care. From this day until Christmas, one has to do as many little favors for him or her as one can. One has to provide at least one surprise every single day, but without ever being found out. This creates a wonderful atmosphere of joy, joyful suspense, kindness, and thoughtfulness. So then she says, like, maybe you find a note that says, uh, in disguised handwriting, I prayed a rosary for you today. Or maybe you f- they find that their bed has been made. Or maybe, you know, it's like... We're doing this at work. Are you? Yes. Uh, email went out today that we're doing exactly this, except for they, they said you don't have to do it every single day, but multiple times a week, leading up to the last day that we're there before Christmas break. And the last present, everybody brings in a present with your with who it's, who it's to... And then when they open the present, you have your name in there inside the present to let them know. Like, mm-hmm. that's, that's, It's really great. I mean, yeah, you could apply it to the office, but I think there's something really great about doing it at home with your siblings, you know, like... The more siblings you have. The more siblings you have. It's definitely... I mean, if you have two kids, it's like... <laughs> go go back into it. <laughs> Gee, it, I wonder who sister drew, you right. know, like... <laughs> go and listen to uh, the pot or the... Uh, YouTube Live and Facebook Live because we had a whole discussion about this in between segments. Something that happened to me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway. So, um, that I thought was really great. Uh, that's not really the Chris Kinda. But I, I like that. But tradition. that's how they kind of sure. take the baby. They're like now their own each other's baby Jesus, sort of. Um, there's another one that they do that they call Shelter Seeker. Uh, and this is a kind of a spin off of an of an old tradition um, about how Jesus or how Joseph and Mary were looking for space in the inn. And so they have a pa- a painting of Joseph and Mary knocking on the inn and the innkeepers like you can tell by the look on his face saying there's no room here, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they will draw nine people from their family because they have more than nine people in their family. Um, and Every day, the painting moves to that person's room. Um, and so it's like they are receiving Joseph and Mary. That is, they end up making like a novena out of it. Um, and they'll build a little altar or something for the painting to come. And they're allowed to spend as much time in their room with the painting as they want. As much time as school and like obligations allow. So According like, to your state in life. So like maybe they'll go have lunch, take their lunch upstairs with the painting. You know, and the idea is that they do it in reparation for um, uncharitable words that they have said throughout the year, or times when they have not been welcoming. So it's like a an act of reparation for your own personal sins. Hmm. The times when you've been the innkeeper and you didn't you didn't welcome the Christ child. I mean, like I dig that. Think about. Think about what like they missed. Idea. What they missed. The God of the, of the universe could have been born in your crappy little inn, right? You know, and you did. You wouldn't make room for him. So anyway, I really liked that one. Um, uh, and then I, I. So that was from the Von Trapp family. from the Von Trapp family. Um, I also just wanted to talk about nativity scenes. Okay. The nativity. I mean, the Protestants are not. They're not pro statues all year, but this is the one time of year that but they I'm, are pro I'm gl- statues. I'm glad they are, you know? Yeah. Uh, the nativity scene is way better than Christmas lights. If you have to choose between one of the two, and you don't. The thing is, you don't, actually. But um, putting, I love putting up Christmas lights. By the way, your house looks great. Thank you. Looks great. Uh, I tried extra hard this year. Yeah. It didn't fall off the roof. It went well. I had a couple moments where I was... A little nervous about On it. the edge of my roof, leaning forward mm-hmm. over the, you know, it's like, I'm already slanted downwards, and now I have to, like, lean forward, thinking, like, is this worth it? <laughs> is this worth dying over? Right. <laughs> like, I also had the thought, like, I need more life insurance. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
I don't, and I say this as someone who doesn't have a manger scene in my front yard. I would love to have one. It's kind, they're kind of hard to find, um, and some of them are just kind of kitsch. I think you know. Uh, yeah, I don't but, like the the cheap looking. But ones. even I think uh, or the dinosaurs with the, with the table. <laughs> yeah, or ones that they do like at the Vatican, or you know. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't like any of those. <laughs> those have been swings and misses I for tr- several I, years. Oh, I thought it's like you know what I said to myself last year. I'm not going to bring up this ridiculous nativity scene that they have here at the Vatican. I have no idea who's in charge up there uh, of the Vatican of. Who's picking the manger fire, scenes? Fire them. I don't know who it is. But that was the worst thing I'd ever seen. him. And I had other Protestants coming. I had Protestant people that I know asking me about it. And it was embarrassing. It is. Like, it's like, look, I, I, it's have, an, it was a, I have no idea. It was just a great opportunity to to evangelize. The, and we just missed that opportunity. I mean, it's like, we just anyway, it. anyway uh, the, the nativity scene is so great. And especially if you can get one that has a removable baby Jesus, that's like... That's really hitting the sweet spot right there, because you can take the baby Jesus out, mm-hmm. and people are going to ask you about it. Protestants don't under, they don't get that, but they get, they get it. No, I think a lot of times they don't. I I have one at work without the baby Jesus in it, and people ask me like, "Hey, you know, you're missing your baby Jesus." It's like, no, I'm not missing the baby Jesus. I have baby Jesus hidden away in this drawer. Baby Jesus ain't here yet. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not Christmas. Uh, it's obviously. I'm just painting with broad brushes when I use the term Protestants, okay? But uh, veneration of the nativity is one of the oldest traditions in the church. So there is there are accounts of the earliest Christians going to Bethlehem to venerate the actual manger scene, which, if you lived in the area, would be really cool. It's hard to do that as an American, but... Uh, so it's just, it's a super, super old tradition to have and venerate the manger scene. And it, you just can't have too many of them. You can have an outside one. You can have a living room one. You can have a dining room one. You can have a bedroom one. I mean, like... A back backyard one. D- yeah, dude. That's like hitting... That's when you're really like firing all, on all cylinders. <laughs> it's like, you have a backyard nativity set. Yeah, that's for me. <laughs> that one's mine. These are all for my family. This one's mine. This one's me. Yeah, that's why it's the best. But uh, it's it's a great thing. It's a thing that really takes all of the accoutrement of Christmas and it focuses it in the right direction because the Christmas light thing is really great. I And actually, they're Advent lights, right? I mean, because we're putting them up now. Let's be honest. They're not Christmas lights. That's fine. I still like doing them. But there's nothing about it that says Jesus. Unless you have like a light up Jesus sign, like... That would be something that or literally cross. says Jesus. Or even a star is a really star. great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But having the manger scene is just so awesome. Especially if it's like big and you can like have your wise men slowly moving across the yard. Right. You know, like every that, every day. You know that I would do that. Absolutely. I would measure like, all right, it's twenty five feet. Oh yeah, you'd get that yeah, means it's eight, a in, ridiculous eight inches a day. Right. Eight inches a day, baby. But you you let um you know, you let your, your children that be part of their their chore or their yeah. their responsibility for the day is you get to yeah. move. Here's the measuring tape. Move it eight inches. Yeah. Yeah, that is really Don't cool. let me catch you moving it ten inches. Uh obviously the Advent wreath is Oh a, yeah, yeah, of course is, the Advent is wreath. is a great uh way to, to celebrate. You know, you, you can do that right before dinner time, uh have a prayer, you know, before dinner it sets it sets the tone of the, the, the evening dinner. Um that's always a good one. Let me tell you the problem I have with the Advent wreath. You know, there's the first candle. It's the one directly across from the pink candle. You can't light that candle every single day at dinner. There's going to be no purple candle left halfway through Advent. You have to. You've got to share first candle responsibilities. Uh, We're running out of time on the radio, so if you could, go to thecatholicmanshow.com. You'll check out the rest of this episode because I do have a question that I want to ask you that I have not asked you or prepped you for. Uh, I'm I'm seeking some advice uh, regarding Christmas and how to... To help your children understand it. So, uh, we're on the Lord's team. The winning side. So, raise your glass. Cheers to Jesus. Cheers. Okay, Juan, I'd also like your input. Uh, hang on. Here. Okay. Because I want to keep, I have one more thing about the Advent wreath. Please. Also, did you know? No, I did this. You did this, not this. You said the same thing I did, except you did this. Okay. No, I no, did, did this. this. <laughs> the Advent. Uh, Advent wreath, I think, is a Protestant from a Protestant origin. 
Hmm. Did you know this? Did well, you know advent what else? Candle, the advent wreath candles. So is Chris Kinda. <laughs> <laughs> well, when it's German, it's like... <laughs> right. It was uh, like... Prom- really? It was m- majorly promoted by Martin Luther. So, like, mm-hmm. I couldn't... Fi- I don't know if he invented the idea, uh, but I couldn't find any... B- any, I couldn't find that someone promoting sense. it before him. That would make sense, though, because he was not for the veneration of saints. St. Saint Nicholas, like, he would be trying to get away from St. Nicholas. They don't venerate saints? I mean, they name their, they name their churches after them. Uh, well, they don't pray to saints. They don't? The well, Lutherans? I think they do. I don't know. Maybe I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak. I'm not sure. Okay. Fair enough. But, uh... I couldn't There's also find, a lot of different types of I couldn't of find so. uh, anyone promoting the idea prior to Luther, so it could have been him. Anyway, but Advent, so here's my thing with the Advent candles. Like I was saying, it is ridiculous that they just expect these. I mean, I get it. You paid $2 for this pack of four candles. You like, don't expect them. They're not obviously not beeswax. Just get bees, beeswax. What I want to do... Just make your own. But also... Just be a man. After that first year, a beeswax candle, like, okay, well, you know, one of those purple candles, you only lit for, like, maybe three days. You see what I'm saying? You have basically a full candle. Some of them's, like, half of a candle. You get to carry that one over. It just doesn't look good. It's not beauty, like, when when you're starting Advent and you've got janky, like, burnt-up candles, okay? I want to make a set of candles... That, don't burn that are down. numbered, that have longer, v- varying longer. degrees of beeswax in them. So that the first candle is designed so that you burn it 45 minutes a day and it, throughout the whole, whole of Advent, and by the end of Advent, it has burned down. So it obviously has the most beeswax in it. And then the next one has less, less. so that and it will burn... The next one has a little less, and the le- next one have a little less. And so less. that they will burn progressively faster, so that at the end of Advent, They're ideally, all... you've got burnt up down. candles that are all about the same i, I, I dig. if somebody else does that now that i spilled my idea you have to send me a thousand dollars i want your first thousand you can have the rest because i'm lazy you can do you can do you can do the work but i want a thousand you have to say trademark in order for it to be trademark oh there you go there you go. and it's binding there. you can't yeah. just declare it <laughs> i declare <laughs> bankruptcy that was not Michael Scott. That was more like uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, Scrooge. Yeah, Michael Scott impression. That was Scrooge doing Michael Scott. <laughs> that it couldn't be done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now whatever the thing was that you were gonna say. Okay, so here's here, here's the issue that I have at Christmas time with my family. I have a big family. Uh, I am when you say that, do you mean that you have people in your family are big? Sure. And I also have a big family as far as in number. You mean like extended in ki- in or directly? Kind, uh, extended. Okay. In kind and number. Okay. Um, I have been, I'm blessed that almost all of my grandparents are still alive currently. Uh-huh. And so as, you know, you grow older, your family grows, right? You take on a family. You yep. bring on family. You still have your family. Mm-hmm. When I grew up, I had four Christmases every year because uh, I had three uh, three sets of grandparents. My mom's mom and dad separated and, and uh, remarried before I was even born. So I have three sets of grandparents and then my 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 parents. Uh, now because we're married, you know I have extended family from on the other side that I also have to go to. We're trying our best. To juggle all of these Christmases, right? Uh, because you don't know how many more Christmases you'll have with the grandparents. Sure. Uh, you want to make memories. You want my. It's a it's a blessing for my children to be with my grand with my grandparents. Their great grandparents during Christmas to have memories of them. Right. Um, so you want you want to do this. But also, your kids are young, right? They're at like a great, like the perfect Christmas age. You know what I mean, and so like you want to be able, them to be able to have memories have memories of with them. their grandparents too, right? You know, and so then you end up. What ends up happening is you have eight Christmases scheduled. If I you, if I you, love it. I think that want, sounds amazing. Well, here's the problem for a kid. Here's what here's the problem with it. What you end up teaching your child, whether directly or indirectly, like whether you want to or not, is what Christmas is is 
you run to the one family to have dinner really quick or, or lunch really fast, open presents, put them all in the van to run to the next place to eat dinner, to have presents, to throw them all in the van, to go to the next place to have lunch, open presents, to go to the next. And so you don't ever actually get to spend quality time with anybody because all you're doing is, okay, we made it. Good. Now we can all sit down and eat. You have you know, an hour to eat at the dinner table. You have an hour or two you know, opening up presents or whatever. You're throwing them all in, and then you're getting to the next place. And so you don't ever want to leave anybody out. You know, the, the issue is, is that you want to be able to spend actual quality time. What ends up happening is you don't have to spend any quality time with anybody. You, try, you do everything for everybody, which means you do nothing for nobody almost. Mm -hmm. uh, it just becomes all you're teaching your child is, oh, what Christmas is, is we go eat and get presents. Eat and get presents. Eat and get presents. Yeah. And that's obviously not what you want to teach your cho your children. Uh, what that's what that's like, what Christmas is. It's very hard to keep the spirituality of Christmas to keep the reason for the season, um, when it is just filled with material uh, possessions, and then also just this stress that everybody feels, whether you you try to negate it or not. Yeah. Of, Hurry, we gotta go because we gotta get to the next place. We, they're waiting on us. Hurry, come on, come on, bud. Let's let's go, let's go. And I just don't know how to combat it. Like I don't, I don't know how to not let that happen because I, I don't want to cut somebody out of Christmas time, right? You know, it's like, oh, sorry, Grandma and Grandpa, we're not going over to your house because we would like to spend quality time with this side of the family. Um, especially right now in, in this weird time that I am in, in my life, because I still have my grandparents around and they're obviously getting up in age. So you never know, you know, which Christmas sure. is their last one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, what, like, what would you advise, you know, how to combat this or how to keep the idea of what Christmas really is when this is happening? So, uh... We both have a mutual friend, Derek Lissy. Yes. He, uh, tell me about some things that they do in Christmas, um, that like I had never really considered before. Cause you know, to me, like Christmas, it, it should, you know, you do it with spending time with family. Like that's kind of one of the things that Christmas is about, you know, like, um, but he kind of opened my eyes a little bit about that. He said, you know, like, very often on Christmas, they stay home. They don't go anywhere. And that they have Christmas together. Mm -hmm. And then, like the next day, maybe they'll go visit people. Um, and you just have to give yourself permission to do that. Um, the, to have, no, we're going to celebrate Christmas as a family. We're going to do it. We're not going to do that whole rat race of like having to get to everybody. Because it is like, oh, you went and saw them, but you didn't come see us. You know, like, right. so... You just say, no, we're, this is a choice we've made. We're not actually going to see anybody on Christmas. We're like, we're going to take this time as a family and we're going to be with just each other. Now that is going to go over, uh, more, really? more or more or less bad in different families. Yeah. For mine, it would go over terrible. Yeah, sure. Cause the tradition has always been, you have uh, Christmas morning as a, as a close, you know, as your, your family and then. Uh, Christmas afternoon, Chris, you know, in the afternoon, right. you go with extended family. Yeah, that's kind of what we do too. I mean, but then so I think, really then I think, don't don't cram it in. I mean, but you can't. I mean, how do you not? Because we actually start a week before Christmas, so we go and have Christmas a week before Christmas at some, at, you know, either my in laws or some of my extended family, because we can't fit it all in. It is literally impossible. So we start a week before. And we go to Christmas, and then we go a week after. And last year we went three weeks after because it was just the only time we could all get together. Yeah, I think that's fine. Depending on you know how many days you want to count Christmas, there's an octave of Christmas, but then Christmas lasts twelve days. But also, you could say the Christmas season goes like till February second or something. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got a long time to visit everybody and just. But take, then, take but it then, slow. Yeah, I know. You, you know, the thing is... Because you're not going to ever please everybody. The problem no, is... No, then, you won't. Then they're like, oh, well, we're not actually doing it during Christmas. You know, yes, we are. You have to tell them, yes, we are. You have to, like, make them make them not think that. I know. It's really tough. 
because it, it is it, it's tough it's because the Christmas you're, season. You're going against the grain, you, you know, are. with your, with your, you know, yeah. It's just tough. And uh, my advice would be also to uh, consolidate or decrease the number of gifts. And if you're gonna be with family, yeah, then make it be about family, not about gifts. Uh, gro- yeah. Gro- growing up, we just did. You know, it's like we had like one or maybe two big gifts. So it's like, hey, I want to get this really nice thing for the boys. All these six sets of six sets of grandparents. Why don't you all pitch in and get this for my boys? Instead of saying like, oh, each one is gonna get his gift mm-hmm. because just number wise, grandparents don't like that though. They, well, I mean, they want to have a present for like. This is yeah. my present to your kid. And we actually do a lot. Of, we consolidate a lot of cuz like once you get past a certain age we just say no presents. But the problem is when you have big families and you have tons of kids, mm-hmm. even if they have two presents each, like let's just say two presents each and we always do the everybody opens one at a time so that way you can see what everybody's getting. It's not just a frenzy. F- frenzy of tearing presents and wrapping paper I agree. Going It's everywhere. like it's like piranhas. Right. The, the first time I encountered the frenzy, I was uh, like offended. A little offended. Yeah. yeah. So even if you have only two presents per kid, but you still have 15 kids there, that still takes a long time. You know, that still takes a while. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we do consolidate because basically what now, what happens is now only kids and grandparents get presents basically because the grandparents, I mean, you want to get something for your grandparents. So, yeah. It's just tough. I mean, it is just a, it's something that I, I don't know how to, because you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, and because you're also dealing with other people's families too, right? So it's not just about your, your family, it's about like accommodating other people's families as well. Because mm-hmm. it's like, well, our our family, nobody can do it on this day, so we're going to do it a week after, okay? So then it's like, well, I can't do it a week after because I have to go over here to this person's, then I'm going to miss yours. So you're trying to coordinate with a crazy amount of families without getting anybody's feelings hurt with it's just yeah to me uh it is very hard a lot of times to actually enjoy christmas except for the christmas morning when i get to see my kids open presents and come down the stairs and things like that outside of that it's very hard for me to enjoy christmas because we are just so go 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 sure and I don't know how to combat. I mean, a time will obviously fix this problem, right? Because my parent, grandparents aren't going li- to live forever. Um, you know, so as families, you know, grow older and, and grandparents d- pass on, and, you know, time, you know, some some time may free up. So I, you don't want to be selfish and say like, no, we're doing this for our family. I know grandma and grandpa that this could be your last Christmas to see them your grandkid your great grandkids during Christmas time, but we're not gonna do that. I mean, I don't feel I don't feel like that's right. Well and but yeah, but at the same time it's really about your kids. I, I mean at least your question was about how to teach them and that's when you differentiate. This is Christmas Day. Guess what? Now we're in the Christmas octave. It's still we're celebrating Christmas season, but it's not Christmas Day. Christmas Day is when the incarnation happened and that's just one day. I'm just trying to keep the focus there and explain them how these other visits were still celebrating, you know, the birth of Jesus, but it's, it's a little bit different. Yeah, I mean, I words, just think... Words matter. I think you just don't try to do it too fast. I mean, and it, what are you going to do? What does anybody else want you to do? Be at their be at their Christmas, and also it's like That's with with, with grandparents. I would say like, hey, um, can we come pick you up and bring you to mom's house? We're all getting together, you know. Like, try well, to and that happens some. But try to get more of them together so that you have f- fewer stops, you know. Right, but uh, that doesn't always work because yeah. you're not always they're not always close. Well, I mean, you can't be expected to go see everybody all the time for every holiday. False. Well. <laughs> Sorry, I mean. False. False. Black bears. Look, look check the Minahan family. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it's just tough it, because you don't actually want to leave anybody out, right? You don't yeah. want to not be at their place. You don't want to spend time, not spend time with them. I don't know how to do that, and 
the again what ends up happening and what I worry about is what the lives that we're living to do this what it portrays to our children what Christmas really is and that's what I get nervous about that's what that's what I, I'm internally struggling with I would say if if Jesus were the one making this decision so you're speaking on behalf of Jesus I'm saying what I would say he would do is he would probably prioritize the people who are loneliest first. So, like, if there's a person in, in your family who's like, well, if we don't go see them, nobody will come and visit. They will have no visitors on Christmas, you know, like, throughout Christmas. Yeah, that's, that's non existent. Okay. Well, then it doesn't sound like it's really much of a... I mean... For at least if, my if family. They, if, they, if they really want to see you, then ha- invite them to come to you. Yeah, that's just a... To me, it's a selfish mentality. No, it isn't. You have four kids. They don't. Right. They literally have nothing going on. Right. You know what I mean? It's it's actually not selfish. It's about what's serving the good of your family. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually not selfish. Don't be selfish about it, you know, but asking someone to like, hey, could you come to us? We would love to see you. We'd like to invite you over. Mm -hmm. I think that makes it a whole lot easier on the family. I understand that like, oh, it's, you know, there's a thing about honoring grandparents, you know, they're the elders, you know, don't make them travel, you know, Mm -hmm. like if if they can't travel, that's something to be considered, right? But if they can, um, it sure would be nice if they would come over to you. Right. Absolutely. And I was trying to think, why can't I give you any good advice? Well, because growing up, First of all, everybody just got together for Christmas. Mm-hmm. It was like a sixty yeah, people party. I have a feeling that and, your uh, your Christmases and my Christmases looked a l- so different. And number two, remember, baby Jesus brought the gifts, so everybody just got one gift because the gift was from baby Jesus. You know, I you I guys, didn't have you guys didn't get each other gifts. No, I didn't have you know eight, sixteen gifts from all my different parents and cousins. Oh wow, no. Baby Jesus brought me one gift. Mm. And, and like I said, it was a nice gift. And later in life, I found out, well, it's because everybody everybody pitched in. You know, I actually have a, a nice story about a, a friend of mine that I think we were in like fourth or fifth grade. And this is, by, this is the, the time that you st- kind of like stop believing or not believing. And she was like... That's the problem is you stop believing in Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> it's, one, exactly. it's one thing you stop believing in Santa Claus, but... <laughs> I figured out this old Jesus guy. Yeah. He's full, he doesn't exist. But, it's been my parents the whole time. But anyway, she told me, it's like, listen, there is no way that baby Jesus is my parents because we are a poor family. And for Christmas, I'm getting like Nintendo 64 games. And these things that I know we would just never be able to afford. But it was like, the entire family was getting together to buy these girls one really, really nice gift. Uh-huh. And here she was in like sixth grade. And like still... No, guys. It's like, listen, you tell me this, but I'm telling you, we are poor. Tell me how this we- works. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. So either my dad is a thief. <laughs> <laughs> or or, Jesus is or, bringing us or presents. baby Jesus <laughs> is bringing us presents. Those are the only two options. And... He's not a thief. Exactly. Man, uh, how, how, how far are we going, to, uh, Juan, currently? At some point, maybe... One, 107, not mucho. Well, maybe we'll save this, but we should, we should tell the story of our dads with Santa Claus maybe, ne- maybe next week. Have we not told that story? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I think we have. I we think can, we have, but it was be a worth, long time It'd be ago. worth telling again. Be wor- I mean, we've, we've been, been doing this five, five years. years. So, yeah. <laughs> Heaven so, forbid we say something twice. Twice, right? Uh, so yeah, so let's 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 hold off on that one because that'll be a good yeah a good story for. But don't let us forget Juan. Don't let us forget to tell the 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 Santa Claus story. We'll do it next week. Okay. We have Cy Kellett coming on, or the uh, week after. Yeah, the week after because we have Cy Kellett coming on next week. Pretty psyched. Pretty psyched. See what I did there. I'm going to just totally kill it at the comedy conference. It's just, I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm pretty sure I'm going to win. 
I don't know. Are there, is there an award ceremony afterwards? I'm, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna I'm to make gonna one win. for you. I'm going to win. Thank you. I will accept it. <laughs> I will start preparing my speech. Good.